Thanks so much. Uh, so today's agenda, um, we've got welcoming remarks uh, from our, our county mayor, Daniel Levine Cava, uh, Colonel Hallberg from the Norfolk District. We're going to get a little bit of the uh, hurricane season in context uh, with some information from our um, Department of Emergency Management. Um, we're going to have an overview uh, from the Corps, Army Corps of Engineers and the county on how we're going forward. Um, a little bit of uh, background on how the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers is integrating studies. We've got folks from the Jacksonville District on to discuss that. Um, and then the village of Key Biscayne also to give a, a little bit of a, a, a primer and update on the Key Biscayne Coastal Storm Risk Management Study, which is related to this one. Um, and then we're going to wait and hold um, all questions um, and discussion at the end. Um, but I encourage folks, uh, as the presentation is, is unfolding, um, please feel free to add comments or questions in the chat. Um, we'll be monitoring that, recording those, um, and, and facilitating the discussion um, at the end with our various speakers. So um, feel free to, to add those throughout, um, or you can save them for the end as well. Um, so with that, um, uh, just a few quick Zoom rules. Uh, again, um, please remain muted throughout the presentation um, until the Q&A. We may ask you to come off mute if you want to uh, verbalize your comment or question. Um, go ahead and put those in the chat box. Otherwise, like I mentioned, we'll be monitoring them. Um, and if we don't get to your question during the meeting, um, we usually stay on to answer any and all questions, um, but we'll document any that come in uh, outside of today's meeting um, and respond to those accordingly. Um, so with that, uh, I'm going to turn it over to our Chief Resilience Officer, Jim Murley, to, to give an introduction. Jim. Thank you, Christian, and everybody. It's wonderful to have the great attendance again that we've had in the past. I see almost 200 people participating. Uh, we hope we'll be able to update you on the Back Bay Project, but as Christian said, and a number of related projects that we're really focused on integrating as we go forward. Uh, to start us off this evening, um, we have uh, two of our leaders that have uh, always given us uh, a, a way forward. As recently as last Friday, they were together uh, as we discussed this project. So I have the honor of introducing our mayor, um, Daniela Levine Cava, who, who will give some welcoming remarks. Mayor Cava. Yes, thanks so much, Jim. Thank you everyone for being here. Truly an impressive crowd just to show how critically important this is in our community that so many are engaged and have been following this so very closely. I am also uh, known not only as your mayor, but as your chief. This is a true example of partnership and collaboration, not just with the Army Corps, but with many other agencies, municipalities, organizations, uh, so truly a great example. I want to especially thank uh, Assistant Secretary Mayor, we may have lost you. I think, Mayor, we lost you. You're back. Okay. Well, so I wanted to not only thank Assistant Secretary Connor for his vision and courage, but also Robin Colosimo uh, for her incredible support. We spoke on Friday, and that is when we got the go ahead. And so this is why we're able to report to you today so very favorably on our next steps in the back base study. So we have come to this joint decision to go. <laughs> uh, and we're, that means that we're going to continue to work uh, on the study for the next four years. Uh, by the way, work on it for the next four years, but with some important intermediary steps that I'm sure will be revealed as, as we go forward tonight. So we couldn't have gotten here without support from the entire core team, especially Colonel Hallberg, Michelle Hammer and the Norfolk District staff. Everyone has been extraordinary. Of course, Jim Murley, the man with the hat, as I like to say, uh, is our fearless leader here in the county on these efforts and the entire resilience office team that have worked 
countless hours dedicated themselves to ensuring that we get this right and that we build a future ready Miami-Dade. So also our advisor, Rock Salt, who is formerly with the Army Corps and indispensable to us in our conversations and planning and to the firm Moffat and Nickel for their sage guidance. And ultimately to all of you. So since the beginning of this process, it has been a publicly informed, people-driven process. People have advocated strongly to utilize nature-based solutions against storm surge and sea level rise. And I am very proud to make sure you all know that your voices were heard loud and clear. And this is now being touted as a model for the country, this Back Bay project. As we approach the peak of hurricane season, we're reminded that a catastrophic storm is always a possibility. Our neighbors on the West Coast were reminded last year. And as we speak, there are, my notes say three named storms, but I think we're up to at least four <laughs> and two tropical disturbances in the Atlantic and none are posing a direct threat right now to our shores, but we are always vigilant. We're a complex community, a place where coastal storm risk management is constantly with us. We have a unique living laboratory that is full of opportunity as well as challenge. And we must always be ready to act swiftly to protect life and property in the face of this more extreme weather that is coming at us with great frequency. And we have more Army Corps projects than any place in the nation. We're proud to be uh, the favorites of the core. And uh, we also are going to integrate this back base study with other projects like the Central and Southern Flood Control Study, the Key Biscayne Coastal Storm Risk Management Study, and more. We're also going to identify short-term projects like future proving, proofing critical facilities and infrastructure. So we're not going to wait till the final report to get ready and hurricanes are not gonna wait for us, so we need to be proactive. We're going to continue the work that we have started with all of our municipalities, our researchers, our local leaders and nonprofits to make sure that your voices are heard at every level, at every part of this decision. And we're committing to bringing in even more stakeholders into the process through the study's environmental justice working group which is another innovative part of this effort that we discussed with the Corps and are excited to convene. So Miami-Dade County is 100% in on this go decision and we'll keep investing time and resources and we're going to sign a chief's report which will help us obtain the federal dollars that we need. So we're looking forward to charting this path ahead together the partnership is the foundation for more innovative solutions to come and just the beginning for us in protecting our shorelines. So thank you very much, everyone. I'm going to go not only mute, but take off my video and I'll be listening for a while until I get to my budget hearing this evening. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Mayor, and safe travels as you go on to your next meeting. Um, our partner uh, in many ways with this whole project has been the Norfolk District of Corps of Engineers, along with the entire Corps family. So it's my honor to have uh, Colonel Brian Hallberg once again address us as we go forward from our GO decision. Colonel Hallberg. Good evening. Make sure that I'm... All right, I am communicating. Great. Good evening and welcome to this significant moment in our journey towards a more resilient and prepared Miami-Dade County. I am Colonel Brian Hallberg, the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers Norfolk District Commander, and it is my privilege to speak before you today as we celebrate a crucial decision to continue investigating coastal storm risk management solutions, progressing the goal of a safer, more secure future for our coastal community. Today, we stand at the threshold of part two of the feasibility phase for the Miami-Dade County Coastal Storm Risk Management Feasibility Study, a continuation that has been marked by unwavering determination, shared vision, and a profound understanding of the importance of safeguarding both lives and the environment. This renewed commitment, the result of extensive coordination and stakeholder engagement, reflects the shared dedication of Miami-Dade County 
Mayor Cava, U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, and all those involved in this critical endeavor. We recognize that storm surge and sea, sea level rise pose significant threats to our beloved Miami-Dade County, threats that necessitate a strategic approach combining engineering ingenuity with a respect for the natural world. Over the next four years, the federal government will invest $7.3 million as we continue to evaluate structural, non-structural, natural and nature-based features and risk management measures for critical infrastructure. This commitment is a testament to our belief that we can harmonize protection and preservation, ensuring the safety of our communities while preserving the ecological treasures that define our region. Through the pages of this partnership, we have heard the voices of the community, municipalities, community members, and stakeholders expressing their aspirations for a resilient Miami-Dade County. And we have listened and we move forward. As we move forward, we remain committed to an inclusive and open process, one that welcomes public participation and embraces diverse perspectives. It is through unity that we forge a pathway toward a future ready for the challenges that lie ahead. Thank you for joining today's public meeting where we will outline our shared vision and roadmap for the remainder of the study. Your engagement, your insights, and your partnership remain integral to the success of this endeavor. In closing, I echo the words of Mayor Cava that this indeed is an enormous win for Miami-Dade County. Let us continue to work hand in hand, harnessing our collective expertise and determination to build a Miami Day that not only thrives in the face of challenges, but emerges stronger, more resilient, and better prepared for the future. Thank you. Thank you, Colonel Hubbard. Um, you will find in this presentation uh, some new voices, new um, spokespeople for the different projects that we feel have to be integrated with the Back Bay project as we go forward. So. Uh, Michelle and I will always be, uh, and our teams will always be here to get, update you on the Back Bay project. But we are committed, as you will see in the forthcoming slides and hear from other voices, that this is a combined, coordinated, collaborative project. So to start that off, and no, no more timely than to keep us aware of real time, you know, issues that are going on as we speak around the world and are affecting other parts of our country. Um, we cannot just look at storm surge. We have to look at storm surge as part of a compound flooding set of issues and make sure that we're uh, aware of how, every, how we have these impacts. So it gives me great pleasure to introduce next Dr. Jesse Sapiro, who's the Assistant Director of our now Department of Emergency Management. Uh, the mayor has made it clear that, these, that the department and our office are to work very closely on this and all projects. So. Jesse, give us an update, please. All right, well, good evening and welcome everyone. Appreciate the opportunity to speak here tonight. So we are coming into the throes of hurricane season to what we call the hot season of the hurricane season. And this is a six month marathon that we go through. Hurricane season is six months long, it's half the year. So we're approaching the tipping point of where we see the most storms. We typically see them between August 1st and all the way through the end of November is the most active part, but hurricanes can occur at any part of the entire year. In fact, the first tropical depression, the storm that occurred first this year actually occurred back on January 16th. So that's the first time that we've had that for about a decade and a half in which we've had a system form that early on. And that's not actually that uncommon. We've been seeing that trend lately happen with storms forming a little bit earlier and also lasting a little bit later. But for the next six to eight Eight weeks. This is really the prime season for our hurricane development. So we've actually had nine tropical depressions. We've had eight named storms. In fact, we had four storms that formed within six weeks just after the start of the official start of hurricane season on June 1st. And that's the first time that we've had that. We've had two storms to name systems that have occurred really rapidly here in the Eastern Caribbean in June. And that is also something that doesn't really happen that often as well. And you can watch the, the news media from this last week and you saw 
kind of the conga line coming over off the coast of Africa of all those storms that potentially could impact the United States. Luckily for us, nothing was a threat to us and nothing remains a threat to us currently. So that's really good news. But just remember, this is a long season. And we have to be vigilant the entire year. Also with that, the Florida legislature approved two disaster tax holidays this season. The first one occurred at the start of hurricane season. And we do have another one that actually kicks off this week on August 26th, and it lasts through September 8th. So this is a second period in which you can go out and get tax-free items for your disaster preparedness kits, everything from batteries to tents to tarps to even generators, and get those tax-free. So we certainly encourage you to take a, advantage of those opportunities while they're out there. So we're in the mid-season part here in September as we're coming up. So just be, be vigilant and make sure you watch your local media sources and information coming from Miami-Dade County and Mayor Cava as well to see how we are positioning ourselves for this hurricane season. So that's kind of where we are with the peak of hurricane season. But just reflect back and look at last year's hurricane season and the the uh, the humans efforts that happened over in Southwest Florida and our partners over there. So one of the things that we are transitioning here in emergency management and Miami-Dade County is we're looking to operationalize a lot of the plans, policies, and procedures that are spread over the numerous departments and the stakeholders that are involved in this process as well. So we've actually contracted with a vendor that is going to be assisting with us in the process to develop a flood response plan for Miami-Dade County. Now, we do have an oversight committee that has been established, and we have a number of whole community partners that we're going to be inviting for comment here in the coming weeks to provide input on the necessary actions that we need to take to be more prepared, position ourselves ahead of time, and also respond and ultimately recover from the threats of hurricanes, as well as the flooding that we're seeing. The rain bombs that occurred in Broward County in April is a good sense to what we can see potentially happening here in Miami-Dade County. So we do have some priorities and specific emphasis that we're looking to address in this flood response plan. We're really looking to better understand the flooding events that can occur throughout Miami-Dade County. Now with that, we're looking to align our current assumptions with regards to planning for flood events and looking at our capabilities and the various tools and resources that are out there. We got a lot of great information, a lot of science and data that helps protect us, but how can we operate, operationalize that a little bit better? In addition to that, we're going to be leveraging a lot of our community partners for input to assist in that process as well. Our community-based organizations, nonprofit, non-governmental, faith-based, those are all our critical partners in this process as well, along with our municipalities, our county and state partners as well. Some of the emphasis that we're looking at addressing as well and operationalizing is the need for pre-season coordination for all of our partners. We should be approaching this much like we are for our hurricane season, but our flooding events can occur really year round. So we're looking to having a little bit more better coordination with all these partners, some preparedness actions, as well as training and exercises for all these partners as well. We're looking to better map and understand these repetitive flood areas and organize our priorities and our capabilities that can address these a little bit better. In addition to that, we need to be able to identify our notifications and our messaging out to the public. That's very important that we get those notifications out in a very timely manner and be able to meet the people where they are, have them available in Spanish, Haitian, Creole, and be able to, to really elucidate what the threat is and what people can do to better protect themselves. In addition to that, there's operational coordination capabilities that we're going to be addressing in this plan as well. Damage assessment is a big part of that. We're endeavoring and having launching a new damage assessment software system here in emergency management to assist all our county departments and our partner agencies throughout the entire county, including our municipalities, to assist with that. And then lastly, recovery. Recovery is a big component to that as well. We want to be very eager and advanced and forward leading when it comes to recovery opportunities that are available for the community, much like we saw in Broward County. We want to position the information and the assets and access to those sources really, really at the beginning of these, these emergencies and disasters when they occur. So these are some of the things we're going to be looking at accomplishing here in the next few months with our flood response plan for Miami-Dade County. And I do have some good news with this as well. We, Emergency Management, is participating in FEMA's Emergency Manager Exchange Program. We currently have one of our staff members that's been detailed up to Washington, D.C. with headquarters FEMA 
for the last four months, and he will return in October back to our offices. But we just got notification that we'll be receiving a very talented, highly experienced individual from FEMA in that exchange program. And this individual will be working very closely with us on our flood response capabilities and planning. He has a great background in floodplain management and is going to be able to be a good complement for us in these efforts, in addition to helping to really provide that federal input for us and clarify how we can get access to these opportunities a lot better. And then here's another thing we just found out today that FEMA is going to be sending us a second person in this program. So we were actually very surprised by that and very elated. So good opportunities and good relationships with our federal partners, such as FEMA, allow us to better prepare and equip our community. And this is really unity of effort. And I really appreciate everything from the Office of Resiliency and Jim Murley and everybody over, over there helping support us in this process as well. So we'll be standing by for an emergency management year round and we'll be in this presentation if there's any questions at the end. So thank you very much, Jim. And Christian, I'll turn it back over to you. Thanks, Jess. I would I would note that our, our uh, Mayor Kava has made uh, a trip to Washington several times and met with the head of FEMA and reinforced the, our desire to have these kinds of uh, sharing of professionals. I see the mayor back on. Do you want to comment, Mayor? <laughs> yes, I'm very excited. I did not know about the second person and uh, certainly the expertise of the person with the flood, um, you know, flood uh, plane, very, very important. And yes, we've been pushing for this since we made friends with FEMA uh, at the Surfside building collapse. So I'm very, very excited indeed. And we applied for technical assistance and got it. And there'll be more good news coming out of FEMA. So stay tuned. Thank you. Thank you, Jim. Thank yeah. you, FEMA. Uh, thank you. Thank you, uh, Madam Mayor, Jesse. and the, the administrator yep. is sending her number two person on resilience to speak at our uh, climate summit in November. So everybody listening, come to the summit. We'll get you the information. Look, that this slide says supporting county initiatives. We could spend the rest of the hour just talking about many departments doing a lot of things. Christian will talk about two things happening in our office, but I want to make sure that you know as we have these kinds of gatherings, Zoom calls, we will bring Durham. Uh, Division of Emergency Resource Management to talk about the great work they're doing in their Water Resources Division uh, to prepare us for future flooding, uh, Department of Transportation and Public Works and their Public Works people. So we will continue to bring the rest of the county family uh, besides our uh, Emergency Management and Office of Resilience to give you updates on what they're doing on these issues. But if you would, Christian, on these two uh, projects, which uh, we are operating with again, with the help of multiple departments in the county. Of course. Yeah. Thanks, Jim. Um, thanks, Jesse. So I'll just touch on these second and third items really quick. We want to get to the back bay updates as well. Um, so many might be aware the the state of Florida through their Department of Environmental Protection or Florida DEP, um, they have a resilient Florida program that provides grant funding, um, which we've been successful here in Miami um, in, in getting those grant funds to protect critical assets from flooding and sea level rise. Um, I think we've gotten over 30 grants over the last couple of years, and we're about to submit uh, a handful of additional grants uh, this year around ahead of the September 1st deadline. Part of what we have to do uh, under a state statute is conduct an updated vulnerability assessment for sea level rise and flooding. So our office got some planning grant funds from DEP and are working now with multiple departments um, to do a critical asset inventory, updating our existing inventory uh, list, and then producing a, an updated assessment um, to inform uh, our grant applications in the following cycles for the state program. Um, I'll mention the municipalities, many who were probably uh, listening tonight, I know are also conducting these vulnerability assessments um, uh, or some have already completed them. Um, but the idea is we're getting a lot of great updated data on, on how all of our uh, county and municipal owned critical assets are vulnerable to various flooding scenarios that the state wants us to look at. So this information is going to be really helpful to inform this back base study, which is also having critical facilities as a primary low hanging fruit type of uh, uh, strategy that we can advance um, as part of this feasibility study. So there'll be a lot of coordination um, between our various partners moving forward. Um, and then on the, the, the third and last thing is it's a really a catch all because 
Um, as you all know, um, this back bay study is is a, an amazing opportunity to advance our planning um, and key projects for storm surge risk reduction. Um, but as Jim mentioned, we have an entire sea level rise strategy various master plans like our stormwater master plan um, and others that are continually year after year um, increasing the resilience and, and investing in um, flooding reduction measures uh, that includes compound flooding rainfall um, storm surge tidal flooding saltwater intrusion and, and other threats that we face so we're investing a lot um, again a lot of this work being led by our various departments and partners uh, as well. So look out for uh, an updated sea level rise progress, sea level rise strategy progress report uh, later this fall around the king tide season. We'll be giving you guys more of an update on all of the county's efforts uh, on that. Um, but with that, uh, we're going to get us to our, our most exciting updates about the back bay study. So this will be a tag team between uh, Michelle from the Norfolk District and Jim, our Chief Resilience Officer. Um, so yeah, I think first we're, we're handing it over to, to Jim to describe some of our key successes. Jim. Might have to come off mute, Jim. Thanks. Thank you, Christian. And thank you for your hard work, uh, uh, everything you've done to help us and, the, and our teams. So we have made a lot of progress in the last year. And you know, this last year was kind of a special uh, if you will, test or, or, or experiment on what would be a normal core process. We went through one, three years and um, didn't find a, a, a set of measures that we all could get around. So we had we went into a pause and then the core thankfully said, well, we, we're ready to start over based on what we learned, but really start over. Uh, but the assistant secretary said to the mayor, let's be sure after one year that we've got the right uh, pieces together because it's those pieces, those items, actual items that you're you'll hear about that become the focus of the more intense study that uh, Michelle and I will talk about. But in that last year, we did uh, get a lot done and we got a lot more people involved uh, at residents. We had a collaboration around a proposal that back in January of last year that the county put on the table. I guess January of this year. That, that here, here we call them the bookends, looking at a host of action items that could be classified generally as nature-based and critical facilities, uh, flood proofing, uh, and then a new idea, new ideas about where structural components might be in place and how we do that. We had to find the right mix of of techniques that the core can help us with. But we're on our way. We're going to continue over time to look at all those actions and find out what is the right mix, what's the level of protection, what is the right kinds of things to do respectful of our economy and our, our the, the kind of community we have. So we'll be looking at all those things. We, we, we be looking at environmental justice, specifically an integration of other projects. Uh, next slide. So we've, we've really liked this overall concept, and this concept involves all the projects, not just Back Bay, of multiple lines of defense for the county as we look at, at the compound effects of different flooding events, from a huge storm surge wall of water to the kind of brain bombs that we heard Chess talk about, to groundwater uh, elevations during high tides, a host of things that uh, you know, we are challenged by as we live here in this in this paradise. But we have to be looking at them and we have to be thinking about how we can invest in the natural resources, starting as far out as the coral reefs, all the way back to how we integrate to the West with the actions being developed over the last 20 years for Everglades. So we're those multiple lines of defense of green and gray measures are really the key philosophy that kind of emerged out of the last year. Now, that's a concept. To operationalize that and to take it apart and test its feasibility means we have to look at these different types of projects that are going on, not just Back Bay, but other things that are going on that you'll hear about. So we, we wanna look for things 
that we don't just talk about, but that we can implement after we go through the required uh, due diligence. We want to continue our coordination with the public, our municipalities. Uh, the Atlanta coastline was one of the, the two bookends, right, of the, the, the non-structural nature-based. And then looking at our the 30 plus year investment we've made re making some one of the world's great beaches you know, uh, along our Atlantic shoreline. How can we look at, at, at that investment, which has to be maintained on a regular basis? And if, and perhaps if, if, if it proves to be feasible, enhance it and make it even more protective of the uh, Bear Island and the mainland to the west. That's part of the Atlantic coastline alternative along with looking at the navigation canals. We are gonna continue that pattern of looking at it. And when we feel we have the sufficient funding and other things in place, the full feasibility. So the, the main part of the project will uh, have a target of a chief's report in 2027. So I wanna turn it over to Michelle, but I wanna make sure everybody realizes we are starting over based on what we've learned and we will have a brand new what, what what's called a, a temporary selective plan, tentative selective plan with a draft EIS that does look at alternatives. So it's not, we're not inheriting what we did before. We're learning from it, but we will have a complete process of putting in front of everyone on this call a tentatively selected plan when public comments will lead to a recommended plan of the full FEIS that makes up the uh, major part of what the core calls the chief's report. So remember, we're gonna have a whole fresh look. You can bring all that we've learned and new ideas from other places uh, to this process. Gives me great uh, pleasure to reintroduce again my partner in this process, Michelle Ammer uh, from the Norfolk district. Uh, the district has been, uh, along with the Jacksonville district, and all the special centers of excellence, they've just gone out of their way to find a path forward with us, and we greatly appreciate it. Michelle. Thank you, Jim, and thank you, Christian. So I'm going to be talking about the actionable measures, and these are going to be the context of the Chief's report as we move forward with these four years. So these four years and remaining $7 million, that was part of original time and funding requests that we submitted back after that pause that we had following the initial three years. So this is part of that um, time and funding that we were approved for. We're going to be looking at actionable measures. So what does that look, what does that mean? Actionable measures are individual separable measures that we believe that we can formulate and design and achieve environmental compliance so that we can include them in a chief's report, which can then be presented to Congress and can be authorized for, uh, for construction, which then goes into our pre-construction engineering and design, and then our late, later our construction phase. So uh, we will look high level at that Atlantic coastline alternative. And so these actionable measures will be uh, evaluated in the context of that uh, Atlantic coastline alternative, but these will be individual uh, measures that can improve the resilience for Miami-Dade County and can provide some tangible risk reduction, looking at critical infrastructure, um, looking at flood proofing for critical infrastructure. I think that's great that the county is going to be doing that analysis ahead of time. That will certainly be very helpful to our analysis, identifying those critical facilities that are vulnerable and could uh, benefit from flood proofing to improve the resiliency. That will be a benefit for um, high frequency flooding and certainly uh, low frequency events as well. And then looking at natural and nature-based features. I think everyone can agree that those in Biscayne Bay will be challenging based on the hardened shoreline that it, uh, is in the upper Biscayne Bay. So we will definitely be looking for input on where to best locate those features. How do we deconflict the different uh, uses in Biscayne Bay, certainly there's recreation and there's navigation channels and there's private shoreline. So how can we locate those natural nature-based features that primarily help us reduce coastal storm risk, but also can achieve additional benefits such as erosion reduction and then also some environmental quality 
in our comprehensive benefits as well. So these are some um, types of natural nature-based features that we will evaluate. So looking at those islands in Biscayne Bay to reduce erosion, uh, wetland restoration uh, throughout Cutler, uh, Cutler Bay area, uh, mangrove restoration along the causeways, again, looking at erosion reduction. And then living shorelines, those couldn't be helpful to reduce wave, atten you know, attenuate wave action. Uh, which can also benefit, uh, cause them uh, benefits for lowering that water. And then looking at other locations where sea level, um, uh, living shoreline or living seawall can be uh, implemented in a hybrid restructure. So uh, looking for those opportunities, the nexus of identifying natural nature-based features and in those areas where risk is occurring, and those features can help reduce that risk. So a lot of additional coordination will be necessary, certainly additional uh, coordination, uh, coordination and uh, getting feedback from the public on those natural nature-based features. And then uh, through this study, we can look at potential um, structural measures, uh, may not be able to get to all of them, but looking at the opportunities of a storm surge barrier, Coral Gables Waterway and Snapper Creek, these were uh, features that were included in the original recommended plan, and they do provide benefits by themselves. So they would be separable measures. And then also looking at Cutler Bay flood wall and or road levee raising uh, in that area to provide additional benefits. And non-structural measures. So focusing on those structures that are vulnerable to repetitive flooding. So these are the high frequency events where flooding occurs. And maybe we can focus in on those areas, also environmental justice communities, those communities that have less uh, buffer to recover from those types of flood events. So these will be a targeted um, evaluation of those communities. And really, again, um, even with we were to look and evaluate the Atlantic coastline alignment, uh, there, that alignment and surge barrier would probably be triggered by a significant events. So there could be more high frequency events that would occur, and we want to make sure that we're targeting those, um, that flooding that would occur during those high frequency events, and the nexus of that being with the environmental justice community. So these are just some examples of what we'll be evaluating in this part two. Jim? Thank you, Michelle. Don't go far. We'll be right back to you. Um, so in the uh, first, uh, temporary selective plan and recommended plan, we did have an area uh, that the Corps and the county in Cutler Bay identified in South County. But when given the opportunity uh, during this last year, we we set the table so that our environmental department at, at Durham could come in and explore how we can really leverage uh, a, a South Day proposal. This became really, I think, one of the biggest changes that's will be subject to further evaluation, but really it was exciting from all the people who were involved. And that's why we wanted to just give, uh, I think, um, uh, Pamela Sweeney, is that right? From Durham, will be just giving us a quick summary on this. Is that right, Pamela? Hey there, Jim. Yes, I'm happy to. Thank you for having Hi, me. Hi, welcome. Um, well, I think between Jim, what you mentioned and Michelle, we're off to a great start even kind of giving an overview of what our goal was here. Um, but really, we we heard from the public and we understand that um, nature-based features can be a really um, meaningful, uh, important, and sound way to think about uh, beating back storm surge and protecting not only critical assets, but also the neighborhoods behind these features. And we also took the opportunity to take full advantage of the integration of these projects, Jim, as, as you and, and others have mentioned tonight, uh, which was a, a monumental uh, difference, of course, in, in this planning process. And in that, I mean, we were able to really look at some of the uh, other CERT projects, um, not only um, well, I should say other Army Corps projects, um, including, of course, our Atlantic option being one of those sort of a synthesis of some of these ideas. Um, but down south, especially really looking at what um, BBC or, and for folks familiar with uh, Biscayne Bay Coastal Wetlands, you could think of BBC or sort of the Corps phase two of that effort um, and looking to really leverage off of um, that endeavors uh, tentatively selective options and, and what was really feasible and making way for um, looking at how canals can be conveyance, 
for storm surge and ways that we can divert water away and make use of that water by hydrating or rehydrating and recreating wetlands. So wetland restoration, I would say, is key down here in these nature-based features and just also taking advantage of structures that really no longer serve a function from a drainage perspective offering a benefit, but rather can serve as conveyance to the neighborhoods and the critical assets behind them. So all in all, we really tried to look at how to integrate some of these opportunities between other projects and this opportunity, um, leverage existing uh, structures and functions, as Michelle mentioned, you know, the levy that runs um, I'll, you know, the L31E levy and looking at options to just sort of reinforce or enhance or strengthen that feature and, and looking at that as an option and protecting the assets behind it. So we really try to integrate existing features um, and existing opportunities with other core projects to make those um, sort of most cost efficient and beneficial for the people. Thank you, Pamela. I want to just note that um... Uh, there's a one uh, information box there at the bottom about a separate study that the uh, county participated in uh, uh, that will provide recommendations for the Homestead uh, Reserve Air Force Base and resilience measures. So we'll bring that back at a future uh, call so that you can hear specifically what's proposed uh, there. I think if with those steps and the things that you can see conceptually on this uh, graphic, uh, we'd be making, I think, some long-term investments to protect that very important uh, military base to our, uh, in our community. So uh, I know there are going to be questions on all this, folks, but let me go back to Michelle, if she'd be so kind to give us the proposed schedule. Thank you, Jim. And so the proposed schedule is what does part two look like moving forward? As we mentioned, we are looking to get a signed chief's report in 2027, and that's important so that we can communicate recommend a plan to Congress who can then uh, authorize that in the next Water Resources Development Act, which would be 2028. So moving forward, we're going to be reevaluating uh, the study area and developing, as Jim mentioned earlier, a new tentatively selected plan. Uh, we will certainly have multiple public engagements prior to that TSP. So when we go to TSP, that should not be uh, a surprise is something that we would have been communicating through our public meetings similar to this. Uh, then we will have our uh, tentatively selected plan and shortly thereafter we will go back out with a draft report. So that will be uh, an opportunity to provide formal comments on that draft report which would then be uh, formally responded to. We'll continue to have our interagency meetings so we'll work very closely with our resource agencies to make sure what we are evaluating and formulating can be, uh, we can complete environmental compliance on uh, prior to our chief's report. Uh, following the draft report, we will uh, work towards what's called an agency decision milestone. Now these are all uh, core uh, specific milestones, but what's important about these milestones is that each uh, milestone along the way you know, we're looking to our partner who we are working very closely with and saying to our partner, do you, do you agree with this plan moving forward? And, and because this is a partnership, we certainly cannot move forward. As we found out from the original feasibility study, we cannot move forward without them. And so we want to make sure that they are agreeing with what we are recommending. There is an opportunity, uh, you know, we can talk about locally preferred plan uh, later, but I think we have been presented with uh, where Miami-Dade County would like to see us. We've heard from the public, and so I think we're in a good position to uh, move forward with those measures <clears throat> to come to a recommended plan uh, and get to a signed chief's report in August 2027. But we can't do that without you, so we really appreciate the support and the engagement, and we ask that you would continue it over the next four years. Uh, I'll just mention again, we talked about the Atlantic Coastline Alternative. Uh, we are looking more intimately at these measures that we think we can get to environmental compliance, and that is the critical infrastructure, the non-structural, and the natural nature-based features. But we will look at that high-level analysis of the Atlantic Coastline Alternative. Now, that will require a separate feasibility study to more thoroughly evaluate, because as you can imagine, that is a complicated system that would need uh, certainly more modeling to look at water quality, and again, the how we integrate those different projects, certainly the Central and Southern Florida system, how that all works together. And uh, again, uh, 
we have to have a deeper dive on that. So that would require a separate feasibility study. But in this study, we would be able to evaluate that at a high level. Next slide. So something uh, that came out in January 2021, uh, in our previous feasibility study, we did evaluate comprehensive benefits, and that's something we have done consistently. consistently. <clears throat> but in 2021, the Assistant Secretary of the Army said, I would like you to do a deeper dive, right? We want you to really thoroughly evaluate these comprehensive benefits. But this is a very um, locally specific comprehensive benefit and really requires a lot of input from the community. So Miami-Dade County has identified values, and I think that will go well to inform what our comprehensive benefits look like. We'll continue that conversation as we work to formulate and evaluate these measures. We'll talk through what those additional benefits that are provided that are not monetary, that are not related to maybe cost and benefits, but are uh, more socially uh, valued, maybe their environmental quality, so our natural nature-based features, in addition to reducing water surface elevations and attenuating waves, maybe there's environmental quality that is associated with those natural nature-based features. So those are additional um, benefits that we will evaluate in this part two, and that will be important in just describing what those features provide. So really appreciate the engagement so far, and we'll look forward to that in this this, you know, as we move forward with part two, and I think that will also help inform what those comprehensive benefits look like. Jim, back to you. Thank you, Michelle. So we're, we're going to move forward, um, working across the family, the, the, the Corps of Engineers family. We've gotten to know uh, multiple districts, multiple centers of excellence, and their leadership right up to the Chief of Engineers and the Assistant Secretary of the Army for Civil Works. Uh, and as you will hear even more in the, in the forthcoming speaker, uh, how the different core projects are going to be integrated together. We will, it's, it's just, we, we know the path forward. The way that happens is to share the information, be transparent, take questions. If we don't have the answers, get back to you. But that's the pledge that Michelle and I and the others that are involved are making. We will re we'll have more pictures like that lower left where we can get together around tabletops and, and do what we can uh, to provide that input. That, that literally, those charrettes led to the proposals that got us to where we are today. So we'll, we'll be back looking to those very same things. Um, so next up, I told you, you're gonna hear from a number of other folks. Uh, we're, we're thrilled to have uh, Amy Thompson, uh, from the Jacksonville district, part of the team that's been uh, given uh, direction to work with uh, all the players to integrate the many different kinds of uh, core related projects. We're not hearing directly today from the South Florida Water Management District, but I, I got to tell you, we everything the core does and we do is linked to their work also, both in design and construction and operations of this huge water management system. So we'll have them as a future speaker also. But Amy, would you give us a briefing on the uh, integration initiatives uh, yeah. that you're working on? Yeah, thanks, Jim. Um, so I'm in a kind of new position in the Jacksonville district, which is an integration planner. We just kind of made that up. So I'm we're working it as we go. But I do want to put a plug out because next week on the 29th, we have our first um, public virtual public meeting of uh, all of the Southeast Florida projects that we're, we're clumping together as our integration projects. And that includes projects that are in planning phase and design and construction. So we have a lot of projects that are gonna give like about 10 minute presentations. Um, so you can kind of get an overview of all the projects in the area and what their status is. So that's on the 29th at 9 a.m. Um, I think there's a press release out also from the Jacksonville district if you're interested. Um, and so I can go, go ahead and go to the next slide. Um, I will do that when I, when I'm done, I'll put the link in the meeting in the chat. <laughs> okay. So one of the keys to building resiliency and integration, uh, requires coordinated efforts from all the levels of government. No single entity can build resiliency alone. The problems that we were related to climate change are uncertain, broad, and complex. 
It's essential to survey and assess relationships among public and private sector deliverables and capabilities at local, regional, state, and federal levels to determine the most appropriate and effective packaging of programs and services to accomplish resilience and sustainability objectives. So everyone has an important role to play. No one can do it on their own. Uh, and the water resource infrastructure is the connector of all of the different levels and agencies. Go to the next slide. So there's multiple lines of defense. We have different mission areas to combat climate change and build community resiliency. So the beach coastal storm risk management projects, those tackle the direct impacts of coastal storm surge and sea level rise. The back bay studies handle the backside of the barrier islands and the bayfront effects from the storm surge and sea level rise. The, the, in this case, they're flood risk management studies, but the central and south Florida resiliency study of the non-federal sponsor is the South Florida Water Management District. That is looking at the effects of changed flood risk due to urbanization and increased rainfall and the compounding effects of sea level rise and storm surge. And then on the more inland side, we have the Comprehensive Everglades Restoration Plan or SERP that also has the South Florida Water Management District non-federal sponsor. And that is ecosystem restoration that provides water storage and filtration that helps the inland flooding risk and enhancing habitat restoration and coastal storm risk resiliency. So they all work together basically, you know, to build the, the resiliency and of, of, of the different, you know, communities. So this is our umbrella slide. You've probably seen this before. <laughs> So the core has um, ongoing and future projects that are across multiple disciplines. If you look here at our, we, we love our acronyms. Um, we have O&M is operations and maintenance. So this refers to how the system operates. This, the, the CNSF is a system of canals and structures that control the flow of water from Lake Okeechobee to the coast. And then we have the, the AER, the Aquatic Ecosystem Restoration, Navigation, Coastal Storm Risk Management, and Flood Risk Management. And so all of the business lines are part of the federal integration and resiliency effort. The, the core planning approach supports the integrated strategy for reducing coastal risk and increasing human and ecosystem community resilience through a combination of of the full array of measures, natural and nature-based, non-structural and structural features, which you've heard earlier in this presentation. The approach considers engineering attributes of the component features and dependencies and interactions among those features. Over the short and long-term, it considers full range of environmental and social benefits, uh, which we refers to the comprehensive benefits we've mentioned um, produced by the features. So we're coordinating efforts across the UK, the USA's key projects is, is key to supporting community resilience. So when we're, we're uh, looking at integration of these, oh, go back one more slide. When we're um, integrating the, the projects, looking at built, uh, resiliency, we're looking mainly at, at two key things, communication, both internal between the teams and leadership, between the teams and with leadership, and then technical coordination. Uh, oops, sorry. Well, it's communication external with sponsors and stakeholders, and then technical coordination that's during formulation, which includes policy, application, model assumptions, and project baselines. And then after formulation, which includes the comprehensive benefits and the effects of projects on each other. And then I just wanted to add, because we've, we've heard a lot of this lately, go to the next slide, <laughs> of people asking, what is project integration? What does it look like? And so we, Tim Geisen, who's the project manager that's working on integration with me, we're the integration team. You'll hear us next week also. <laughs> we've we look, thought about, well, what is integration? How, how would we define it? And, and we came to, a conclusion that to us the, defining integration is coordinating planning and in the future implementation 
of multiple core projects that have different, um, different missions that fall within the same footprint. Uh, and all of those projects have to have a different, they have a different function. They have to perform in a different way. And so in order for that to be su successful, there has to be clear line of communication between the different project delivery teams. And they have to have some sort of alignment in their planning strategy that they can share data, they can make sure that you know they're in sync with one another so that they're not working, um, they're not in conflict with one another uh, to be successful. And then how, how are we successful in that effort? And by having a su successful integration basically happens when we can get all of those projects and all of those different mission areas, we can get them to the endpoint where they can be authorized and implemented and they can achieve their objectives and they can also work together to improve resiliency, uh, not just work independently. That's, that's my Thank slide. Thank you, Amy. Thank you. Yep. You know, I would add from the county standpoint, we, in the end, we want to see this collaboration, the integration of the projects integrated with the way we think about our, our future, right? About the zoning decisions we make, the, co the projects that are taking people off of septics and putting them on sewer. Uh, it, it isn't just integrating the core projects, it's integrating the core projects in a way that we can make, we, we can leverage that both ways from the core gaining from what we're doing on the ground with our municipal partners and, uh, and the same for us being able to pull down from those projects. So we have a lot more to learn about this. This is just yeah. beginning. You're at the very, you're going to have a lot of chance to have input. Yep. And I will add that okay. I'm going to be the planner on Key Biscayne. So I'm looking forward to working with you all more. Good. <laughs> looking well, forward and, to it as well. <laughs> and, and we did want to uh, have one of our 34 communities uh, focus on their work because <laughs> it's in particularly um, parallels, the stuff you've heard. I see Manager Inglesis here from Coral Gables. I know he'll be interested and we'll, we'll invite Coral Gables back, Mr. Inglesis, to tell us more about what you're doing. Uh, but in this case, the work at the Village of Key Biscayne really is a microcosm of what we've been talking about across the entire landscape. Looking at the, the shoreline of the Atlantic, how we integrate that with the things we're doing within our communities from, from uh, stormwater management to other things that each community prioritizes to the Back Bay study. It's all captured in this project that, that will parallel starting at the same time as the work we're doing. So over to uh, our Chief Resilience Officer, Dr. Sammy. Yeah, thank you, Jim. Uh, we really appreciate being part of uh, this discussion and this presentation. Um, I want to thank you personally, as well as uh, Mayor Kaba for sticking by our side through all the uh, twists and turns that we've gone through um, as we navigate the court process. Um, I also want to thank um, Colonel Booth in the, in the Jacksonville district um, and their team, because they've been really, really helpful to, um, to us as a community um, as we faced uh, the uh, challenges of getting into the, the, the CSRM uh, program uh, on the beach side, um, and then what, what, what to do afterwards um, after agency decision milestone um, and, and, and the, the decision that, that essentially um, we should be on like a parallel path to the county. Um, but before, before getting to sort of the history of uh, how we got to where we are now, I wanna put it into a little broader context because there is a lot going on on Key Biscayne and, and we did um, launch an aggressive resilient infrastructure and adaptation program uh, recently. And um, it's, it's looking at uh, basically an island-wide municipal uh, um, infrastructure upgrade. And um, it's focused really on several different pillars of resilience, um, not the least of which is shoreline protection, which we really can't do without the core in the county. But we're also focused on upgrading our entire stormwater system um, to deal with the, the challenges of intensifying rainfalls and, um, and changing boundary conditions like sea level rise um, and groundwater and, and whatnot. 
Uh, but we're also looking at what sort of roadway improvements we have to do to complement the stormwater system. And as we move from a gravity driven system to a more actively pumped system, what are we going to do in terms of hardening our, our utility infrastructure? Uh, because we're going now to a pump system, so we need to have a stable power supply. It, and everything is so interconnected. So what we're trying to do is uh, is essentially an integrated project approach where in in every zone that we have to attack, of which we've got about eight to cover the entire village, um, we are looking to do the entire suite of infrastructure upgrades in a coordinated way. Um, that's a heavy lift when you add it to the shoreline protection element. Um, and so thankfully, we are partnered up with the core. Um, and Christian, if you could just go to the next slide. We started with the core and trying to get into the CSR program back in 2018. Um, we, we reached a little bit of a hiccup in the sense that we lacked public access to our beach. And so um, we, we needed to develop a, a policy and a plan to augment that public access, which, which we've been doing aggressively. And, and fortunately, we, we really are at a point where we've got essentially two out of three additional public access points locked in. Um, the third is, is a work in progress. But with that being the case, we were able to get re-included in the CSRM study, which is this main segment um, that was being done for the county from, I guess it was government cut all the way up to Hallover. We got included in that. We made it all the way to a tentatively selected plan, which people were really uh, very receptive to. And that included, uh, obviously, continued beach re-nourishments. It included an enhanced um, dune line system that was also reinforced, and then also tieback walls. But then we reached this little hiccup in that you know, a lot of the benefits area that was being protected by the Oceanside solution was vulnerable from back bay inundation. And it was at that point during agency decision milestone that we could have either been completely eliminated or through the hard work of a lot of folks at the core and the county and ourselves, we were able to essentially petition to get included into a back bay feasibility study to ultimately come up with a, a, a complete whole of island shoreline protection solution. And at the end of the day, I mean, at agency decision milestone, it was really a, a wise move to, to decide that we should proceed on a parallel track to the county's CSRM main segment study and, um, and take, take a, a breather and take the time to do the back bay feasibility as a complement to what was already undertaken for the ocean side to ultimately have, have a, a whole of system solution. So um, that was a, a, a long process to, to get to that point, but we're there now, um, 2023, uh, we're, we're in the process of working out the federal cost share agreements with the county and the core, and we're in the process of establishing the interlocal agreement between the village and the county. And it's looking like all the pieces are falling into place, the funding, uh, you know, the initial funding, you know, for FY23 was put in place. We've already got FY24 funding lined up. And now it looks like we're poised to basically kick this off um, at the end of, <laughs> excuse me, October. And um, that'll be that three by three um, that's commonly referred to um, with a thought that about 120 days in, there'll be a reevaluation of the scope to see sort of like if it's uh, in line with with the, um, the work that needs to be done or if it needs to be expanded. And um, look, I mean, the reality is we're very excited to be at this point. Um, we've got a lot of work to do on, the, on, on Key Biscayne. We're doing a lot and we're poised to do a lot over the next 10, 15 years. But without the county and without the core, we really would be quite, I think, overwhelmed with the resilience challenges um, that we have for this community. I mean, we are an island and we're a low-lying barrier island. And we're just basically um, under assault by water from every which way, top, bottom, left and right, ocean, bay, everywhere. So that's just a very quick little thumbnail sketch of, of where we're at on Key Biscayne. But we're excited to be, in a way, a little pilot project to the county. And we're happy to be working in lockstep with the county and Moffitt Nickel as well, because they're on our 
program management and construction management team, along with Black and Beach, and see how the solutions that we put forward on Key Biscayne tie in to the innovative solutions that are being considered by the county at a much broader level in the Atlantic solution and whatnot. And so I think this is really a great, a great time to be working together. Um, and it, it, and we're happy to be coordinated and um, in lockstep with them, um, with the county. Oh, Jim, I think you might be muted. Try to get off mute. Thank you, Roland. Thank uh, you, and give our best to Steve and the Village Commission. I know they're meeting tonight. Um, I, look, I will. Yeah. This is just one of our 34 cities. We make the commitment to all of them. Uh, their issues are all going to be different from the coastal to the inland. Uh, they're going to have flooding issues. And we're going to be working with them through our various programs and departments. Um, it's not surprising, though, given the long history that the county has working with the South Florida Water Management District and the Corps of Engineers, uh, that many of these large scale projects are part of that partnership. And, you know, I, I really think you need to recognize why the Corps is here. It's because it's been recognized there's a national interest in making an investment, both in these studies and in the their implementation uh, that involves the federal government paying up to 65% of the cost. And the, this planning study is 100% paid for by the uh, Corps. Uh, for, but it's, it, it means a lot to the taxpayers of Miami-Dade County that we have these partnerships uh, going on and that, can, uh, that we can share the costs of deciding what we want to do and then how we're going to pay for it. So um, we are uh, this 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 county is a lot different than it was ten years ago in the way we approach these issues. I guarantee you, the core and the district are also, and we will continue as institutions to evolve as long as you stay involved with your participation. So uh, we have, um, as Amy mentioned, your next uh, public meeting is uh, coming up on the 29th. And you'll hear more about how we're going to integrate these projects. We'll continue to work with our partners at the municipal level. Uh, and want to make sure you remember, this, these two new institutions did not exist in the first part of our uh, process of doing the study. There is the uh, Biscayne Bay uh, wa uh, Watershed uh, Management Advisory Board, uh, made up of county commissioners, members of the public, city representatives, others. They meet quarterly and we update them. These are public meetings. They meet in the chamber. They have, you know, Arella Begay, our chief bay officer, supports them. So we have a regular rotation of being able to brief that group. In addition, the state of Florida created the Biscayne Bay Commission made up of state officials who are impaneled to review recommendations for how the state can help us make uh, uh, plans that we all agree to uh, come into fruition. So we've got a lot of layers of folks involved uh, and we need to take advantage of it. So we threw a lot at you. We purposely did not want to make this just about Back Bay. It's about how do we have a comprehensive integrated approach with our stakeholders, with our public uh, to move forward. And we're excited about that. And I believe if I'm right, are we ready for questions and answers, Kristen? Yeah, thanks, Jim. Uh, I'll just give a few quick reminders and then we'll get to the, the question and answer session. So um, if you guys haven't already signed up for the county's Office of, of Resilience newsletter, there's a, a link there. You can go to our homepage and you'll see the link in the top right to get um, um, really a really fantastic summary of our work and the work of our partners that our communications team puts out. Um, and if you have specific questions following the webinar, um, you know, you can always reach out to us uh, at resilience at miamidade.gov and this other um, Army Corps of Engineer email address. But uh, for now, a lot of these updates and uh, presentations and the recording will be posted on the um, Army Corps website at the bottom there. Um, and yeah, I think we're ready to jump to the question and answer session. Um, we got a lot of great comments uh, and a lot of questions too. We're going to focus on answering the questions first, um, since we are, we are recording and we'll have all of the comments uh, for our review 
later. So if you want to ask a question, if you haven't already, um, you can enter that into the chat. Um, uh, and when we uh, call your name uh, or um, read your question, we'll direct that to an uh, appropriate speaker. Um, and we may have you come off mute um, if we need to sort of clarify a question or so. So um, I'll turn it over to um, our communications folks, uh, Sandra and our colleague, uh, Robert, to uh, start reading a few of the first few questions we got. Thanks. Thanks so much, Christian. And thanks, everyone, for entering your questions in the chat. Uh, we're going to start with a question from Steve Richards. He asks, are there pumps in the plans and what is meant by surge barrier systems? Okay, uh, I have a, a thought on that, but maybe Michelle, do you want to sort of take it from a core perspective first? Sure, I would just say that anytime we are formulating or recommending any structure that would hold back water, we would need to uh, need to consider whether a pump station would be necessary to make sure that we're not inducing flooding behind that structure. So it depends uh, when we get into the study, it, again, what those measures look like, if they would need a uh, pump station. And, I, and I, I would just note, you know, from if you go on to the landscape today, uh, from the Everglades to the canals, the Tamiami and the Miami River, we have pumps on those canals. Uh, we move water 24 seven. That's what makes uh, the ability to live here in, in um, South Florida is our very sophisticated water management system. The structures are the thing that we as a community have to continue to review with better information, better feedback and to make a decision in the future about where and uh, how and uh, how to pay for them. So uh, that's to be determined, but they do present a level of protection that many of the other actionable items uh, do not, um, at this point at least, uh, have the same level of protection. So that's where I am on this. Next question. Thanks, Jim and Michelle. Our next question is from Don Derez. He says about every seven years, there are beach sand nourishment projects to protect homes and hotels on Key Biscayne from erosion. How do the Corps and Miami-Dade rationalize using citizens' tax dollars collected from middle class and poor neighborhoods to provide storm surge and sea level rise protection for wealthy properties? homes, hotels, and beaches? So I can certainly start with that. And then Jim, if you want to uh, jump in. So that is a really great question. And when we look at um, evaluating and recommending a plan, we do take the taxpayers' funding, that is federal dollars, we do take that in consideration. And so when we look at that, we are looking at it from the federal perspective. Does the plan uh, that we're, we're evaluating, we evaluate different alternatives, which one of those plans maximizes that benefit. Now, we traditionally talk about cost-benefit ratios. However, certainly that also includes comprehensive benefits. So we're looking for that plan that maximizes those uh, cost benefits, but also uh, cost benefits, but also um, looking at those that maximize the comprehensive benefits. So that's a great question. Absolutely, that's certainly on our uh, minds in terms of the value of the federal taxpayer dollar. This is a partnership with Miami-Dade County, but we are also looking at it from the federal perspective of where we can invest those dollars to get that return on that investment. Yes, it is a partnership that, that goes back um, many decades. Uh, the, uh, 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 recently, we, we lost Harvey Rubin, who was one of our great environmental leaders. He was the originator of the uh, partnership. He created the uh, partnership. There were the state of Florida, the uh, Corps of Engineers, when authorized by Congress, and, and our county government and city partners uh, fund both the maintaining the beaches and the dunes and the, board, and the boardwalk behind it. That's a system. That's part of today reducing the energy of a storm surge. It has multiple benefits as it sits there today. By the way, the last four years of that 
nourishment has been 100% federally funded due to accessing uh, post Irma recovery dollars. So we are very fortunate to have those federal dollars at that level. Most of the country would die for the beaches that we have. I'm not biased at all about beaches. <laughs> so uh, what's next? Thanks so much, Jim and Michelle. Our next question is from Eve Cook. She asks, has the county requested that US ACE consider compound flooding in their assessments? Well, uh, Michelle, do you want to take the first? Sure, I, Jim, I think she's referring to Section 8106 ah. of the Water Resources Development Act of 2022, and that is the ability for the non federal sponsor to request the evaluation of compound flooding. I, I think that um, the challenge in this case is we are dealing with emergency supplemental funding, which means we are uh, limited to the approved time and funding that we have received that the special case of about uh, the emergency supplemental, it is 100% federal funding. Uh, and as that uh, emergency supplemental was, was started in 2018, uh, that funding, as you can imagine, is near the end. And so there are not additional funds available within that emergency supplemental. And, and uh, certainly I understand that that uh, it doesn't seem like a big deal, but certainly from the agency's perspective, we have to be very careful about the color of money, and that's the source of that funding. Uh, to be able to do that analysis, we, you know, there, we'd have to look at maybe the, the county providing funding for that analysis. But that uh, certainly has not been requested at this time. Yeah, I think that's one of the many features of this uh, process going forward, where we'll we will specifically dig in on on issues I, that. Provision, I think, I don't know if it applies to all the core projects or just want, just the, you know, specifically coastal storm resource management studies. But um, I know that from the county standpoint, this has been brought to our attention. We were uh, focused on getting us to go and that, and moving forward from go, I think we definitely will evaluate that in terms of all the core projects uh, that we're the non federal responsible for or. Um, working with the other non-federal sponsor, primarily uh, the Water Management District to see how this applies. Thank you, Jim and Michelle. Our next question is from Johan. He asks, what specific pro protections are envisioned for barrier islands, Atlantic and Atlantic coastline, other than corals, which he notes have been dying in the recent heat wave? Well, the concept of the multiple lines of defense is that various initiatives will, you know, we'll take advantage of them uh, based on what, you know, the table nature sets for us, right? We, we didn't have any control over the, uh, the onset of the heat wave and the warm waters. Um, there will be some undoubtedly documented losses. There are also some recent documentation of some of the corals that have survived. There's a huge air, uh, effort going on, state and federal and uh, not, universities and others, the transplant coral. Uh, that piece of it, we can bring back for everybody to hear more on. Uh, there's, a, there's some uh, pilot projects for some artificial reefs between the natural coral lines and the beach that the county and all the other uh, environmental agencies are evaluating. And I think the, uh, from that standpoint, um, we're, we have to sort of dig in on each one of these areas and find out which one of them play out to be acceptable. And, you know, there's an environmental con uh, requirement here, both through NEPA and uh, in addition to that, the core has to be able to demonstrate to their uh, oversight officials that this is a, it needs certain opportunities to be uh, permitted. So um, there's a lot of environmental uh, thresholds that have to be evaluated as we go forward with any of these projects. Jim, if I can add real quick, uh, I know for our barrier islands, um, as mentioned in our presentation, um, the Corps and the county will be looking at non-structural measures as well. So that's the 
the elevation of residential buildings um, and the uh, flood proofing of commercial uh, or businesses um, on the barrier islands as well. So um, that's you know another line of defense or level of protection that uh, the study will get to dive into uh, a bit more in the coming year and following. And, and of course, I think everyone recognizes that most of the barrier islands are uh, part of municipalities if they're not in a county or state park. So um, very, very little um, unincorporated area. So it's about partnering with our municipalities uh, and with them evaluating um, what what makes sense. I mean, Miami Beach has an extensive set of projects going on uh, that, that are uh, effectively part of the solution uh, that their community is prioritized and paying for. Thanks, Jim. Thanks, Christian. Uh, our next question is about timelines. Juan Galan asks, is there a timeline for after authorization in 2027, 2028, with regards to seeking monetary approval from Congress and actual shovels on the ground construction so that whatever solutions are devised are in place ASAP? and the project as it is initially conceived is fully functional. I certainly can- Go ahead, Michelle, take that. <laughs> yeah, no, absolutely. So as soon as we are able to recommend a plan, we will begin that process of including that request. Uh, the pre-construction engineering, I'm sorry, pre-construction engineering um, and design phase, I apologize, I'm not sure why I stumbled on that, uh, is the next step of that process. So we have the feasibility phase, we have the what we call the PED phase, and then we have construction phase, and then after that, it's operations and maintenance. Um, as soon as we have a rec uh, as soon as we have a chief's report, we're going to start that budgeting process to include it in the budget request so that we can move into that PED phase. The design phase um, is necessary, certainly, as we work to further that design and then can get to a point where we can let our first contract and then move into construction. So Certainly something that we will be targeting. We will be putting that in the budget as soon as we are able to so that we can compete nationally for those funding. As you can imagine, uh, there's only so much Corps of Engineer funding that is each year, and we want to put that in and, and make sure that we are, uh, describe that well enough so that we can compete well for that funding. I'll also mention uh, each one of those phases uh, requires an agreement. So for the feasibility uh, uh, Phase we had we signed a feasibility cost share agreement that was back in 2018. For the uh, PED phase, we would sign a new agreement with Miami Dade County that would be the design agreement, and then moving into construction, we would then sign what's called a project partnership agreement. Each one of those phases again requires uh, county to sign on, and we move forward in a partnership. Yeah, I would you know I would say this is a game where you make multiple bets. Right. We, we're 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 hoping that this process we're engaged in through the with the core, which goes on. This is the same process that goes on around the country, right? With changes depending on the landscape. But but the county also engages in Tallahassee to bring back uh, funds from the members themselves in member projects and through the grants. Um, and we engage with our congressional delegation on specific projects that could be implemented prior to the studies being being done. I, I think uh, in a particular project that you should we'll bring back the uh, specifics on was a successful application that the South Florida Water Management District and the county made uh, to FEMA for a large sum of money to work on the canal structure uh, on the C8, on the uh, Biscayne. So, we're going to be moving into actually with our partners there and our and the county's a, uh, a partner, our Durham is a partner, um, to really evaluate a structural change way ahead of the rest of these plans getting done. So it's not it's not linear se sequential. It's a multiple things going on where the funding allows you to move forward, you move forward. And by the way, uh, the mayor was on her way to a budget meeting tonight. Every one of the 34 cities in the county in, in these next two months are deciding where to spend our precious dollars. Some of that will go to projects that complement what we're talking about tonight. And if they're not, you should be there telling them about it. Oh, I didn't want to say that. Sorry. Thanks, Jim. Thanks, Michelle. 
Our next question is from Delaney Reynolds. Delaney asks, as our focus in tonight's discussion is largely storm surge and sporadic periodic flooding, what exactly is the plan for when flooding becomes consistent inundation as a result of sea level rise? So that's a great question. Hi, Delaney. Um, it's one of those that they love to call existential questions. Uh, we, we are, as you know, uh, committed to that long-term change in condition. That's the reason we have a sea level rise strategy. It will not happen. Uh, it'll happen over time. That's what sea level rise is. It's, it's a gradual and sometimes uh, episodic rise. It'll affect the other events. We think the things we're putting in place will give us some of the tools that we know about today to address this issue. Others we're going to have to look at um, as a community and make decisions about how we respond to inundation in certain areas. Inundation isn't across; it's not, you know, totally across the landscape all at one time. But low areas will impact, be impacted sooner and we'll be making decisions collaboratively about what we do there. Uh, we have some great scientists at the uh, universities that collaborate with us on these issues to help us think beyond the, what we know is the conditions of the past and the current future and to push those issues uh, in front of us. So we, we can't escape them. We, we intend to look at them. You'll see how we evaluate them in part when we issue the annual report on the sea level rise strategy. Thank you. 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 Robert, can you repeat the question? Absolutely. Is the idea that we can put off uh, walls and other structural solutions and deal with natural solutions until then? Walls and big pumps, excuse me. Well, let Michelle answer, but I, I think from the county standpoint, what we call the Atlantic Shoreline Project requires a lot of study, which will start now and will continue. Um, we did include in the uh, package that we uh, showed the leadership and got approval, uh, some structural proposals for the Coral Gables Canal and the, uh, what's the second canal? Uh, Snapper Creek. Yeah, so that, that'll that be a community test with in Coral Gables and with every, all the other players. You know, we'll be looking at those too uh as in this study uh to see if they are um can be brought forward to meet the various minimum requirements that that we have for the chief's report so and even in the south dade one uh there are some structures proposed michelle do you want to expand on that absolutely i think jim i think you hit it on the head um it the fact that the uh, additional modeling and analysis that would be necessary to recommend anything along uh, within that Atlantic coastline alternative, we will uh, evaluate it again at a high level, but additional resource surveys and geo, geo environmental surveys um, and additional analysis will be necessary for us to be able to fully evaluate whether that could be recommended for, um, you know, uh, as a plan. So I think our target for this four years is to focus on those measures that had broad public support, and that was the critical infrastructure, non-structural, and na natural nature-based features. And I'll just mention that even though there's lots of focus on natural nature-based features, that's still going to be a challenge, certainly within the Biscayne Bay. And again, we were talking about those conflicting uses within the bay and different projects that are in the bay and land um, the shoreline uses along that area. So. That's going to be an undertaking as we look at modeling uh, what um, what uh, designs will help reduce risk uh, in the natural nature-based features, and so that'll be a lot of modeling associated with that, and that's what we'll evaluate in this four years. But it was 
as you mentioned, Jim, it will take additional time and money to evaluate that big, uh, more complex system. Thank you, Michelle, and thank you, Jim. Our next question is from Johan. Does the four-year study include modeling and cost estimates of historic neighborhoods NIPs, neighborhood improvement projects, such as road and infrastructure elevation and projected cost of harmonization funds for contributing buildings and other community essential buildings? So I'll Michelle, go first. <laughs> yep, and then if you'd like to jump in on that, I will just I will. mention that when we look at uh, non-structural, we uh, look at a neighborhood cohesiveness, and so we do also evaluate cultural uh, resources when we are evaluating a community. So when we look at that, we're looking at um, those historic structures, and that's included in the analysis through NEPA uh, for our plans that we uh, recommend. So I would say at that level, we are considering historic structures, but I will also mention that the features of the measures that we recommend, that's only one piece of the puzzle for resiliency for Miami-Dade County. There are other projects, as you're mentioning, that the county is investing in, and that just uh, collectively that holds together uh, improved resiliency for Miami-Dade County. So it's not only what we will recommend, but also those additional investments that uh, the county is um, prioritizing to help reduce uh, risk within the county. Yeah, I think I would just add that these are very uh, locally based decisions that we have to make with our municipalities and in the unincorporated area with the neighborhoods. Um, we don't want to just go in with a solution that is house by house or commercial structure. We need to have groups of buildings that make sense and then the responsible uh, public entities, be they the county and or the cities, you know, th this is the time to think about septic tanks to sewer. This is the time to think about um, road elevations where that's appropriate. Uh, the, 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 this project's not going to pay for that, but we, we can easily meld uh, a integrated funding from other sources that allow the disruption of the community to be um, um, lessened and that the overall value of the property when the, the projects are done um, could be, will be demonstrated uh, because they're going to be a more, less, less vulnerable to the, the future in terms of flooding. So I, I think it's up to the, uh, every, all of us engaged, but certainly local officials to um, closely examine what we are going to be referring to you as non-structural components, flood proofing and elevations. When some of the plans that are done around the country, uh, like in the Monroe County plan, 90% of the plan is flood proofing and elevations. Is that somewhat accurate, Michelle, <laughs> now that I said it? I'm sorry, Jim, say that one more time. I apologize. I was, I was looking ahead. At I was just, I was giving a, a, an estimate that 90% of the Monroe County plan was elevations and uh, flood proofing. So our neighbors of the South who, who did a study, um, got it authorized, are now getting this next steps of, without repeating what we've been saying. We're, we're gonna be talking to them all the time. We talk to Collier County all the time. Matter of fact, we talk to cities all around the, the country that are doing these studies every six weeks to be sure we know how they're addressing these same problems. So it is, it's gonna be collaboration uh, at the local level to make the flood proofing and elevations work. Thank you. Our next question is from Juan Galan uh, regarding the Miami Rock Ridge. Mother Nature gave us a ridge. The original pioneers respected Mother Nature and placed their homes on the ridge and only placed on the bay their boat houses. Can you please describe uh, how we're recognizing the best way to use the ridge? I, I'm just going to turn it to Michelle, but I think that can, in part comes into the modeling, doesn't it, Michelle? Absolutely. Uh, so I, I don't want to go backwards in uh, certainly in our study area uh, previously. And when we looked at the 2021 plan, it did tie into that ridge when we were looking at structural measures. But we fully acknowledge that that was certainly not 
uh, well supported by the public and um, acknowledge that the path forward is looking at these uh, natural and nature-based features and critical infrastructure and non-structural. But uh, I'll just mention previously we were, we were tying into that RID to take advantage certainly for the reduced cost and the physical features that were already there. But I acknowledge um, that the Atlantic Coastline alternative that Miami-Dade County presented certainly provides a more comprehensive um, potential to, you know, provide more comprehensive benefits to the county uh, than what we were able to evaluate in the earlier recommended plan. And Michelle and Jim, if I can add to that, um, I know our, our our Derm team when they've been looking at the South Dade area, um, you know, looking at um, uh, existing levees and roads and. Um, you know where that naturally high ground is. I think that's a, a key element they're wanting to to explore and build on. Because uh, yeah, where we have that naturally high elevation, um, you know maybe there's ways to um, to elevate certain areas to provide uh, that protection along with the ridge. So um, something absolutely going to be looking closely at uh, as we get further into the feasibility study. But it's a great point. Thank you, Christian and Michelle. Our next question is from William Quinlan. Has the U.S. ACE considered the risk of underground seepage of seawater during a storm as a compound flood risk underneath and separate from the mangroves working to dissipate storm surge wave action? The water table is already awfully high and without more green space to absorb the rainfall during a storm, the stormwater system would get overwhelmed. Well, Michelle, from this perspective of the project, why don't you go at it, and then I'll add something I know is we're doing with the Water Management District. Sure, absolutely, Jim. I'll, I'll start. I'll start off with that. I would say this is certainly very important. Uh, looking at uh, barriers, so if we're looking at areas where we're cutting off water. I, I imagine that as we get uh, into the design, and then certainly as we move into that pre-construction engineering and design phase, that will be an important. Uh, element to consider as we work on the design of that feature. So that's something we're not there yet. We have to work on certainly identifying those measures and determining if they're feasible. And then as we uh, identify those measures and, and make that determination, then we can look at the, um, the locally local um, elements that uh, or impact that feature and then just determine what we can complete in feasibility and what may be necessary for further evaluation. The groundwater is obviously a key element of living in South Florida, right? The, the porous lime rock, which fortunately is stable. It, it doesn't, uh, we don't, we don't have uh, earthquakes. That's one, one positive. Uh, and we don't have as much, um, uh, you know, the, the land doesn't recede as much as it does other areas. It's just porous, right? It's a sponge. And the salt water has, had all, has a long history of, of affecting the groundwater. That's why the water, uh, water and sewer department maintain a constant uh, vigil of, of testing with the U.S. Geological Survey of where the salt water intrusion is. And it's pretty been fairly stable because of the way the water management system is operated. And our well fields are well to the west and not threatened by saltwater currently. But th that is a key part of living in South Florida is, is monitoring the saltwater uh, part. Now, as we gain um, more sea level rise, this impact is going to be greater. And um, the uh, level of the uh, groundwater to say where the septic tank drain fields are is already a factor in the way water, our plans for um, replacing septics with sewer, uh, already, that already goes into the estimate. And there's a lot going on on that in the county and, and in the cities. And we'd be glad to bring that back for more, more detail. Thank you, Jeff and Michelle. Our next question is from Barbara Bisno. Is anyone in the county working on the property insurance issues in Florida? I'm sure Manette, Michelle wants to answer that. <laughs> I'll defer that one to you, Jim. 
Well, I'm working on it. I'm trying to lower my own insurance policy. So I guess we all face this, right? Um, county, the mayor is very uh, aware of the impact that both federal policy as it relates to the flood insurance program, right? Beyond the control of the county, beyond the control of the state, um, with, with one variable that we're working very hard on, I think we'll have, um, we'll, we'll make progress, and that is the community radiant system, which where we demonstrate to FEMA that we're doing things that can reduce and mitigate future flooding. So if that, if we're successful, uh, we are able to reduce uh, some of the rate increase in the federal flood insurance program. Flood insurance. Homeowners and wind and hurricane insurance, state run. Not the federal, not the county, the state. Uh, and those, you just read the paper like the rest of us, and it's just getting out of control. Uh, and and the citizens is gaining a lot of policies is under our programs, the state law, they can they can ensure. So I cannot offer you any particular solutions that the uh, county has right now, other than the mayor's directed us to review the situation and see if there are more things we can do. We are actively trying to reduce and mitigate future flooding and lower our score in the community range system. And if, if that occurs, there will be a savings to individual holders of federal flood insurance in the county. Uh, I should have specified that. Cities do that independently. And some cities like uh, Cutler Bay are down to a three. On a one to 10, 10 the worst and one's the best. They're down at a three. The county's at a five. Uh, so that's the, that's, uh, we have a lot of cities that are, are, are making progress on that also. Thanks, Jim. Um, take up a few more questions here. So uh, this question comes from John Wall, and um, actually it might be one uh, that Amy Thompson from the Jacksonville District could could tackle. Um, the question is, when is integration evaluated? Does it happen once projects are approved? If integration is done at the planning stage, what happens if the associated integrated project isn't approved? And does that push the implementation of the project back? Hey, yeah, I can I can answer that. So. Ideally, we're working to integrate these projects that are all working through the planning phase from the start. Now that, that doesn't always happen because this is kind of a new thing that we're, we're kind of <laughs> trying to make sure that all of these projects that are happening at the same time, that, that, that we can work together. But as you can imagine, as one project gets ahead of the other project, it's going to change the conditions for the projects that are moving at a slower pace or are not as far yet. And so, you know, we're looking at ideas and, and ways that we can, you know, have a, have a rolling sort of integrated modeling or um, combined modeling efforts so that as one project comes online, we can, we can assess the entire system, ways that we can make sure that we're keeping track of what the changes are as projects come online. Now, it wouldn't, I don't think it would set any other projects back if, if one project, for example, didn't get approved. They wouldn't be reliant. The goal isn't for them to rely on each other, but it's for them to be able to, to function together, if that makes sense. So, you know, we're, we're looking at ways, the way that the core, core projects are funded, it doesn't really work great <laughs> for integrating projects because each project has their own funding source. So working on this in between makes it really difficult. And so we're trying to work through that and that's probably our biggest challenge, but we're trying to come up with creative ways to work across the project lines. Um, and uh, we're, we're having a huddle next month with just our core team members to try to tackle some of that before we come out to stakeholders. And so we're, we're working hard to, to try to answer some of those questions. Thanks, Amy. Um, thanks everyone for these questions and for, for sticking around. Um, the next one uh, comes from Barbara. Um, she asks, 
what are tieback walls um, and are they a possibility for uh, the causeway neighborhoods? I think I mean the neighborhoods along the causeways in, in Biscayne Bay. Um, so maybe Michelle could start. So Christian, I'm not, I think that might be a different project. I'm not tracking tieback walls, certainly in our evaluation uh, in this four years, but if someone can maybe clarify that, then maybe I can speak to that. Jim, I, I can jump in on this because I, I think I mentioned it. One of the things that were being considered um, when they did the Oceanside analysis for Key Biscayne was um, a combination of beach renourishments, enhancing and reinforcing the dune line, and, and then also utilizing tieback walls, which are structural you know, systems that would go from the dune line westward towards Crandon on the north and south boundaries of the village to basically mitigate the storm surge threat from the northeast and the southeast um, as, it, as it would arrive Key Biscayne Beach. Uh, so they are structures, um, and they tie into the dune line, and they would go westward towards um, towards the causeway. And then, obviously, the question then becomes, well, what happens west of Crandon? And then that's part of the reason we're doing the Back Bay Feasibility Study to come up with a whole of system solution. Thanks, Roland. Um, yeah, so our next question uh, from, from Juan Galan, um, I think he's asking a question about how the uh, potential storm surge uh, gate system at the Coral Gables waterway could work. Um, he, he notes storm water comes out through the waterway, so placing a gate stops the storm surge seawater, but it also stops the water uh, from flowing out. Um, so. Um, asking why is the Coral Gables waterway structure still in consideration and think about how that would work in those scenarios, how it functions as a system. Yeah, sure, Christian, I can start with that one. Uh, basically, we anytime we are stopping water from getting out, uh, we're actually, of course, the purpose is to stop the storm surge from running up that waterway. But uh, in consequence, we are stopping water from draining out, as Juan mentioned. So we would have to evaluate what that uh, ponding would result, what ponding would result from stopping that water, and then certainly would need to uh, add uh, pump stations that would uh, alleviate that additional ponding of water so that we are not uh, you know, inducing flooding behind that barrier. I would just add that you know, one of the things that's come up as we talked about this at a high level was you know, how, how often do those gates close? And, you know, they're designed for storm surge. Not, not an intense rain, not a king tide. Storm surge, the wall of water that's pushed like we saw over on, in Port Myers. We all probably, many of us remember the um, storm surge from Andrew. But we we already have in place a large infrastructure project, the Bay, the port tunnel that has surge gates at both ends, and they close when the uh, captain of the port decides, uh, based on what he hears from the hurricane center, that the port, physically the port, is going to experience storm surge. So this this is not happening that often, but it is a if 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 we were to decide. And you know, and, and it's only happening if, if we, as a community, decide to do build these things. That that's an insurance and protection we want. Then the operations of those gates will be a, another thorough evaluation, and the core requires an operations plan and and uh, testing of the structures so they don't, you know, they can be run. But they don't. They don't. Our impression, based on the structures we have today at the tunnel. These are not being closed at all. Yeah, but the tunnel doesn't have any storm water going to it. So please, let's well, do some real analysis before you do any of these crazy things. I've traveled the world and seen more gates and went through more locks in my life than any of you have ever seen, okay? And you need to understand the flow of water. I also modeled flood water when I was a 
University of Florida engineer. So I think it's a great idea, but nobody's really thought it through because as a matter of fact, in the current system, due to the density of water, which has to do with whether it's salty or not salty, salt water goes in on top and fresh water comes out in bottom. So, you know, I mean, it's nice to think about something that seems like an easy solution, but just remember the Everglades. That was an easy solution. Where are we now? Please. Oh, it was tough 20 years ago and it's, we're still working on it. But well, um, I mean, I, I just, it bothers me because I live here one, and I'm, I'm 20 foot above sea level. I don't have to worry about it, but you got to flood all my neighbors to the east, okay? Uh -huh. All of that man-made land in Cocoa Plum, Tahiti Beach, Sunrise Harbor. If you put a floodgate for seawater at the Lejeune Road Bridge, okay, you will increase the water level east of, the, of that gate, okay? And you also haven't even thought about what the hell do you do with the stormwater? Rain in a hurricane is normal. Coming in through the waterway, where is that going to go? So, I mean, I just find it to be such a, a kind of an amateurish idea. If it was that easy, they would have done it when they built the canal. I mean, come on, uh, guys. We are going to invite you, Juan, to all of the meetings we have on that structure because you have a lot of expertise that I think you can share with us. So be, get, get ready to uh, get an invitation to come to the meeting and make sure your input's there. I'm happy to help you. I've traveled the world and I've gone in my own boat all over the the, the locks of the uh, San Lawrence Seaway, as well as many other places. So I understand water flow better than your average person. And it bothers me for people to think that it's such an easy idea. Put a gate in, that's going to solve it. No, you have to analyze how the water flow flows are going before you even think about a gate. Well, okay. for the record, I speak for the county, we don't think any of these ideas are easy. No, no. I, I don't think so they're that's easy. Why you, that's why you proceed to do all the due diligence, the four years of study, and then more after that for anything that's just structured. We need I your agree. expertise. We need you at the table. We'll, we'll make sure you're there. I'll, when be, we I'll, I'll be happy to participate. And Jim, I, I second that. Nothing that we are recommending or evaluating in this uh, part two of this feasibility study or even more later in the looking at the Atlantic coastline alternative, nothing is easy. So we really appreciate everyone's uh, participation and certainly any information that's available, we are interested in uh, looking at that information. So Juan, thank you for that comment. Thanks Juan um, and thanks welcome. Michelle and, uh, and Jim. So another question comes from Sebastian um, is asking, uh, when are they starting the project in Brickell Bay? Is it sometime soon? Not sure hey, which project it might be, but maybe is Sonia on from the city of Miami? I th they had something they were looking at at Brickell Bay, but I'm, I don't think it's a specific piece of what we're looking at. Do you, Michelle? She's not yeah, on. I'm not tracking. Oh, go ahead. I was just, Jim, I was just going to mention, I'm not tracking that specific project. And I agree that might be a Miami specific. Okay. Thanks. This uh, next question comes we'll track from. It down. Yeah, we'll try to uh, follow up with you, Sebastian, and get the right information to you. Um, another question from uh, Rachel Silverstein: um, How does the White House guidance on valuing nature-based features factor in? Michelle, you want to go ahead? So certainly, we are. Uh, we will take in any guidance that is uh, provided to us that we need. To include in looking at natural nature-based features. I would say specifically uh, when we look at natural nature-based features, comprehensive benefits I think are going to be very important for helping recommend uh, the different measures. Uh, as we discussed uh, maybe earlier, our study authority for this area is coastal storm risk management, so that's the primary lens that we would evaluate these measures through. But I, we believe that um, looking comprehensively and looking at those uh, comprehensive benefits will be key in helping us formulate and uh, recommending natural nature-based features. Thanks, Michelle. 
Um, the next question uh, comes from Beatrice. Um, I think it might have been addressed in the chat in, um, from, from our colleague at James at Durham, but the question was, where is the water pumped to? And um, I think James mentioned that the pumps, uh, some of the pumps proposed are collected, are, are co-located to nature-based features that would benefit from that water. So, um, you know, uh, smaller pumps to help rehydrate, I think, some of the wetlands that were talked about in South Dade. Um, uh, and then I think uh, another question from Eve Cook. Um, in the U.S. Army Corps press release, it mentions the uh, quote, two proposed storm surge reduction alternatives. Um, are these only two locally supported options or are they bookends? So Chris, I mean, I Scott, think the, the term, yep. Michelle, uh, uh, the bookends concept came from the county's proposal. So that, that wasn't a technical core term surprise. Uh, it was to try to communicate at a high level that we thought that there was a, a, a these levels of defense, a set of different things that we needed to have further evaluation. And, and we also proposed it because the first three years of the study, we didn't propose anything. And we were reacting and that, I think, was part of the reason we, we found ourselves in the position we did after three years. So we felt the responsibility to put a high-level concept on the table, which we called the bookends, which involved the Atlantic shoreline elements and many of the other things that we've talked about tonight. Um, that's the what will be evaluated in terms of the concepts and time and money that we have as we go forward. Uh, I probably missed something in that response. Michelle, what did I miss? Absolutely. So those bookends help uh, us evaluate and consider uh, that high-level analysis. And so that's what we'll evaluate in this part two. And then uh, further down the road, if we're able to get a, an additional feasibility study, we'll be able to dig in and look more uh, detailed at environmental resources and certainly modeling to help uh, determine whether that plan is feasible and if it can be constructed and implemented. Just to clarify what she's she's now referring to the shoreline Atlantic shoreline structural pieces. We we will we will continue to make a high level evaluation looking for the resources and time to take them to the next level that would demonstrate they are what we want or don't want. Okay, thank you, Jim and Michelle. Our next question is from Joshua. He asks, will surge barrier systems and any unnatural structure proposals consider the natural flow into the bay and estuaries, wetlands and canals in its natural state and its effects on the natural environment and other long-term effects? I'm concerned that these gray solutions will cause a whole other level of issues and environmental concerns as I have seen in California. Uh, I'll start with that, Jen. Um, when we look at, we look at a future without project and we look at the conditions, we would, uh, you know, as we talk later about uh, barriers or even focusing in on coral gables, um, we look at what the flow is right now, we would model that, and then certainly we would uh, model what it would change, what that would look like uh, with a structure in place. Uh, even with that structure open, there would be some changes in the flow, so we would have to evaluate that and look at uh, that impacts to water quality. So certainly something we evaluate uh, as the uh, as we look to um, recommend features. I'll just say that in addition to that, we'd also consider the structures that already exist on those canals. So there is a limiting structures on those canals right now, uh, and those would also be considered as we look at, um, you know, how a, a barrier would uh, 
how the flow would flow into the Biscayne Bay, looking at the Atlantic coastline barrier, or more specifically at Saver Creek or Coral Gables, how that would, how those uh, structures would interact with each other. The big canals I would just mention are part of a system of canals, the secondary and tertiary canals. Many of the secondary canals are owned by the county or the cities. Uh, some of the tertiary canals are privately owned, others are public. That's an entire system that the county and the South Florida Water Management District and the Corps tend to, uh, with, with funds available to study. We're, we're starting with what's called the resiliency study, which is on the main structures on the big canals, the ones that carry the numbers like C6, which is the Miami River, or C7, which is a little river. So right now, those studies are underway. Uh, but but um, authorized but not funded is a comprehensive study that will go further back into the drainage system. You know, we have to look at the plumbing system. It was designed for gravity flow. Uh, for a, It was designed for a pot, uh, ultimate uh, ser serving a population of a little more or the million people. Uh, and those just aren't the conditions today that it was designed for. That's why you're here's all of our attention to looking at those systems and structures and how they're operated. Great. Thank you so much, uh, Michelle and Jim. Our next question here is from Audrey Sue. We hear that St. Augustine's Back Bay Study Team is doing uh, monthly virtual update meetings for the community. Can the Miami-Dade Back Bay Study Team do the same? And uh, a second part to this question is, if the core can please elaborate on the community engagement opportunities for helping develop metrics and criteria for the CBE, um, which I'm assuming is the compre comprehensive benefits analysis. So. So I will uh, start with that. Uh, go ahead, Michelle. <laughs> well, I, I, I think say, we, St. Augustine is, is just started and we, we've been, they're part of the regular meeting we have. And so we're all, all talking. It's a much smaller area, um, much smaller. So, uh, you know, I think that there, uh, that's just, that plays into it. But the regularity of when we have public meetings, I think, uh, can be determined based on, when, one, what we have something more to share. And two, the responses you guys give us on these calls uh, in, the, in between, uh, we're going to be reaching out to groups. Um, I, I, don't, I wouldn't rule out a monthly call, but you know, sometimes not a lot happens in a month uh, on these big studies. So uh, we, at the same time, the county and the cities are going to be having meetings all the time, right? And, and you, you should be able to hear how our projects at the county level were being impacted by these big core projects. It, I don't want, that's not a solid answer, I realize, but I think we want to evaluate the timing uh, of putting together, you know, two, 300 people like this Zoom call. As in parallel, have going to have in the future more charrettes where, we, where we're very valuable at the beginning of this first year and other meetings at the municipal and stakeholder level. Michelle. Yeah. Uh, Jim, I couldn't say, say that better. I agree. We want to make the best use of everybody's time and make sure that when we have the meeting, uh, that they're productive and we're providing something uh, substantial, something tangible to share at that time. So I think as we move into part two, we'll certainly look at our communication strategy uh, when we will have those public meetings and if there are uh, key points where we think that it'd be valuable certainly to reach back out to the public, then I think we certainly can evaluate having additional meetings at that time. Great. Thank you, Michelle. Any further comments on how community engage, what are community engagement opportunities for helping develop metrics and criteria for the comprehensive benefits? So I think that's something that we certainly can evaluate during a uh, you know, Charette, as Jim was mentioning, uh, I think we've worked very closely with Miami-Dade County to talk about values. Those are values that already exist uh, and are emulated through other um, programs with Miami-Dade County. I think that's a good starting place for those, but certainly through Charette or um, other opportunities, public meetings where there's recommendations for consideration for comprehensive benefits. 
I think all of that input is great, and I just uh, encourage anyone to certainly provide those comments of uh, things that uh, could be considered, uh, but I think maybe through the shreds, again, are a good place to provide that input. Thank you very much. Our next question is from Alexander Zastera. Has there been uh, any discussions about partnerships with the Miami-Dade County school system? Some of the projects like the mangrove restoration planting would be good field trip opportunities, as well as an introduction to the project to the younger generation. How can we use this project to also build the next set of environmental leaders? Uh, I can say, uh, most directly that the county works very closely with the um, chief sustainability officer at the school board system. Carly is barely new. She came on after uh, the school board put together a, um, uh, a clean energy task force uh, and their recommendations are having an impact on, you know, decisions they're making about say the bus fleet. You probably saw some of the news, but the school, the school system owns a lot of land. And they are, uh, they're looking at, you know, when partners come to them to see what might be uh, anything from broadening our tree planting to um, some of the uh, properties are along the main drainage canals. Could they be temporarily used uh, when we have an overflow of a canal? Uh, I think they're open. They have, they have their primary responsibility, just like the rest of us, right? That's the education and care of our, of our children and the facilities that they're responsible for with taxpayer dollars. But they're an active partner, and I, I couldn't agree more about the education opportunities that the uh, field trips and other things that are going on. We'll, we'll have the school board, we'll have Carly come to a future meeting, Christian, and give us an update on all they're doing and uh, maybe some of the school, uh, school uh, student level communities, committees that we know and work with. Thank you so much. Our next question is from uh, Mahi Ramos. Uh, Morningside Park Shoreline Project in the city of Miami is incorporating the existing living reef and a tall boardwalk slash seawall. The park currently floods even during a summer storm. During a tropical storm, we get flooded on the streets abutting the park. And if it's bad enough down residential streets in the south side of Morningside, what plans are there for drainage with the shoreline project? This could significantly flood out in the neighborhood if the current flooding patterns are not addressed prior to building a seawall. Uh, I'm, Michelle, you, you may remember this area in the Edgewater uh, area. So I, there is nothing in the current uh, plans that are going to be subject to further review for that area in the core county project that we we're talking about tonight beyond elevating uh, and flood proofing. There could be some opportunities with the city who owns the park uh, to expand upon nature base. But I know that I, I, don't, I don't think anybody from the city's with us. If they are, they're welcome to comment because they'll know better than I do. Uh, but we would be you know, working with them. Our, our Department of Environmental Resource Management will be very involved if their structures along the shoreline. So that's where I see the situation now, but we will, uh, that's another ins an instance where we have to work very closely with our municipal partner. And by the way, the county parks have resilience plans that are going into implementation, right, Christian? Can you, you might want to, I think there's uh, several that are going for. Uh, yeah grant. yeah i'll add just briefly the county parks department did a, a series of i think 12 or 13 sea level rise studies for our waterfront parks and um many of those uh, studies led to project recommendations many of which are already being implemented um uh, often through grant applications like the resilient florida program so those uh, are some great uh, projects some examples of our parks uh, critical assets being adapted for, for future flooding um, and sea level rise. All right, thank you so much. Our next question is um, from Beatrice Baldon. How are all these plans working with the Everglades restoration? Amy. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I can answer that. <laughs> 
So um, two of the projects that I think um, was mentioned when we you talked about the South Dade area as part of the Miami-Dade Back Bay, um, two of those projects, one of them is uh, under construction by South Florida Water Management District and the Corps, uh, the Biscayne Bay Coastal Wetlands Project, it, which is basically phase one of the BB SEER, we call it, Biscayne Bay and Southeastern Everglades Restoration. <laughs> it's a lot of words in there. Um, those two projects, one in construction, one in, um, in planning, they don't have a tentatively selected plan yet. Those are the two that really overlap um, this project. And so working with those two teams is, is very important for, to make sure that we work together and um, that they can all function. So we've already had meetings between um, the county and with the Norfolk district and the project with the Biscayne Bay Coastal Wetland team, because a big part of the Biscayne Bay Coastal Wetlands project is Cutler Bay um, ecosystem restoration. And so making sure that they can work together and, and that that ecosystem restoration can work in conjunction with some of the features that may be included in the Back Bay project are, are very important. And so we're, that's the, one of the major goals of working this integration is that we can merge what's going on that, with the Everglades, with what we're doing on the coastal side, um, with our flood risk management, with the resiliency uh, project that Jim mentioned earlier. And so those are the, the active efforts that we're currently working. So I'd like to, I see my friend Rock Salt. Uh, and you know, the, it's not just what we're doing with, Ever, with the Everglades CERT projects. It's the larger picture of what we learn from Everglades that's really guiding what we're trying to do today. Rock, can you just give us, you do this better than anybody, your thoughts on where we are and how it relates to what we've been doing with Everglades? Um. <laughs> Well, thanks, Jim. Um, <laughs> when we when we were working on the Everglades, it also was a project that was almost too big to get your head around. And so uh, we, we did develop a comprehensive uh, approach with the understanding that as we started working on it, chunk at a time, we would learn and then we would adjust uh, as we move forward. Uh, in, in the parallel in our case is we don't, we, we can make a guess what sea level rise will be, but we'll know a lot more in 10 or 20 years than we do now about what that is. And so how do you, when you factor that in? So the answer for the Everglades was a, a commitment and a, a series of studies that continues we're, we're approaching the end. I shouldn't say that. We're getting closer to the end. Um, but, uh, but at the start, um, you know, the leader said, this is, this is like open heart surgery. You can't start and then pause it in the middle. I mean, you have to keep it going. I think what we've talked about here is, is in, it's in, a, in a way, it's really similar. What Michelle and Jim have briefed about in the back bay study is sort of the, the 2023 understanding of what we what we can do with the available resources, time and resources that we have. Jim talked about other things that we can do sooner uh, with that, with other with other authorities, other capacity. Uh, Michelle also mentioned that once we get to the, the August 2027 chief's report and the design for the pieces of that, uh, that, that we will have the opportunity to bridge into consideration of some of the things everybody's been talking about. I, I think in the Everglades restoration, what's been important is that we have, we have projects proceeding uh, year to year to year. And so we have 
progress. And I think that the theory is we never want to do something. We want to try our best to do to do everything we do to make sure this is something that we're going to need to do no matter what the final solution looks like. So, for example, protecting critical facilities. That's kind of the low hanging fruit that we're talking about here. It's not in the water. It's, it won't take extensive uh, permitting or, or uh, environmental concerns, and it can provide real resilience uh, uh, to the uh, to the county. And no matter and, and however we the county is already working on that uh, in terms of the assessment, the analysis of, of those kinds of things. So I think the lesson from anything as as comprehensive as this is that. It's all you don't know the answers, the final answer today. We won't know it in four years, but we will know enough to do important things next year, the year after that, and the year after that. Then, when the chief's report co comes in, we will have a new set of stuff that can be direct fruits from this study while we then start on the more comprehensive effort. Jim, I don't know if that's what you meant, but uh, um. Um, well, I, you, you grasp what I think we've all struggled with is, as you said at the very beginning, it's a very complex set of issues that we have inherited, right? The, the landscape, what sits there is the legacy of past decisions, right or wrong. And we that's where we start. And we have to have, I think we grew confident that the process you described for the Everglades would get us there after some bumps in the road. And that's the way I feel this will happen. It's just, it's like you said, we have to do the things you don't regret, no regrets, and then also keep your eye on the larger picture. I mean, the Central Everglades Project Rock was not the focal point in 2000 that it is today. Correct. And, and, and the, you know, climate change is more than sea level rise. Yeah. You know, climate change is also uh, rainier rains and drier droughts and all those kinds of factors that the core that the core is and the count all of the resilience community is trying to get their head around and learn as we it came up a little bit before about nature-based solution I think Rachel asked the question about nature-based solutions nobody knows exactly how well those things are going to work so we will try some you know, we will figure out what is the best places to try it and then monitor it. Keep us game. They may, <laughs> they may lead us on this. Monroe County, some of the other places that are ahead of us may, may give us the lessons that we then can apply in, in, in the most logical places uh, for, for the county as we learn ourselves. And uh, I think the mayor said that, that uh, the, the the Army, the Corps was telling her in, that, 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 that this is a, a model for the Corps, that we're talking now about things the Corps has not done. Uh, it, the Corps is learning better how to do use these kinds of, of uh, approaches, and uh, particularly on, on these comprehensive kinds of uh, efforts. Thanks. Thanks, Rock. Um, we're, as we're nearing the end, uh, one question uh, comes from uh, Ms. Curtis. The plan that shows the measures taken does not show any measures around the city of Miami, Miami River, and Little River. What is being considered for that area? That is where the previous wall was proposed. Well, Michelle can uh, double back on me, but there's no walls proposed in this project on the canals slash rivers, except for the two canals that we talked about earlier, uh, Coral Gables and the other one to the south for feasibility. Is that right? No, that's, that's right. We're not looking at any structural measures where we had previously recommended measures before. I would say that uh, when we're looking at natural nature-based features, we've identified those tentative locations. Certainly we're looking through Biscayne Bay uh, where we can uh, formulate and recommend natural nature-based features. So that might be a consideration, but yes, we have taken off those structural measures that were considered before. 
Now, that said, and, and you know, Ms. Curtis and her firm has done uh, Yeoman's work on this. There's a lot of specific projects the city of Miami and others are looking at that we hope will form part of this web of, of projects that we, we will see along the shoreline. And I won't go back into it, but the canals are the subject of what we call the resiliency study with the, with the district. Um, the South Florida Water Management District is the non-federal sponsor with the Corps on the resilience studies, which include those two water systems. Not the full gamut of what we'll want, but that plus the uh, comprehensive study when we get that funded. Thank you so much. Our next question comes from Ms. Yolanda Nunn regarding the non-structural modification parts of the plan, that is raising residential buildings and flood proofing of commercial buildings. Who bears the cost of those improvements? And to further this line of inquiry, in light of the movement of today's economy, with many commercial buildings facing impeding default, that give those properties back to the banks, is the county prepared to acquire the buildings so that the flood proofing can be done? Or would that fall to the banks? Uh, well, those programs are voluntary. First. That's correct. Nobody is nobody will have to engage in in, in a lot of details about yet to be determined about how we actually ramp that up and and go to scale if you will um but there's no mandatory aspect of that so you'd be a, a, the funding would be projected to be 65 percent federal and 35 percent local or or combination of local government working with the homeowner or the business um that's sort of the package right now but a lot more we really feel like this is an area we want to sit down as a local government with our municipal partners and talk to the core about, you know, may, maybe we can do more of the heavy lifting on this area. Um, this is what we do, right, with our homeowners, uh, the permitting, the requirements for elevations uh, for new buildings. So, but we have to figure some of those mechanics out. Uh, Michelle. Oh, absolutely, Jim. That's basically what I was going to mention was the cost share of 6535. So that includes uh, non-structural measures as well, but that again, as you mentioned, is made up of voluntary. So you can voluntarily, uh, if we determine that the structure would benefit from a non-structural measure, either elevation or flood proofing, uh, you can voluntarily participate in that program. Um, and it's, as Jim mentioned, it's not mandatory. Thank you. Our next question is anyone considering the environmental and economic impact to our ecosystem for changing our natural coastal environment and water flow with unnatural solution pr proposals? Jim, I can uh, tackle that one. Uh, certainly we are required to uh, be compliant with the National Environmental Policy Act and that considers the existing condition, the existing environment, and then how the recommended measures would impact that environment. So yes, I would say we're looking at the habitats, we're also looking at the natural systems, and then again, how that would be impacted uh, by a recommended plan. Thank you so much. Our next question here is, should we have more watersheds? Uh, that is areas of undeveloped urban land to collect rainwater and storm surge to allow this collected water to drain into the aquifer. Perhaps the, lin the linear park under the Metro rail should be considered as an example. Huh. Well, I think uh, the answer is yes. <laughs> And yes to the to the um, underline, which is a county project, uh, but but certainly uh, sponsored by the underline conservancy and Meg Daly and all of her leadership. But there, that landscape under that elevated system was never uh, developed to handle stormwater. The water just came out of a pipe, right? Uh, and now it is. It meets all of our stormwater requirements. So that's a permit that they had to receive to build the project. And it, it, you'll see it, uh, and with the vegetation, everything, it'll be a great example. 
But generally speaking, we need more land where water could be stored. That is the focus of what the uh, water management sister calls their level of service studies. And uh, the county works on that. The, our Durham partners at Water Resources work on that. And um, But land is scarce and land is valuable. So that becomes the constraint we all work in. Thank you. And back to you, Christian. Yeah, thanks so much, everyone, uh, for sticking with us. I know, um, I think Johan and others might have uh, some, you know, clarifying questions to to dive into later. Um, if, if it's okay, Johan, I, I gave you my personal email address. I'd love to follow up with you about uh, your question um, uh, to help clarify it. Um, I know we're reaching the top of the hour here at eight o'clock. Um, I want to give a, a huge thanks to um, both the Army Corps of Engineers team, uh, Michelle, uh, and the, the rest of the folks, Miami-Dade County team, um, uh, communications folks, Jim, um, uh, the Jacksonville District, Amy, and, and our municipal partners, Key Biscayne, uh, Jesse Spiro, Emergency Management, and all our other uh, speakers. I hope this was informative, um, and a huge thanks to everyone, the stakeholders, the residents, the community here who hopped on to, to get an update about this project. Um, this this really great opportunity. We're we're really excited to um, take the lessons learned from the last four years and give us uh, you know a really strong vision and process moving forward that'll be um, hopefully uh, you know more equitable. Looking at nature based features with more um, more interest, um, and it's going to take a lot more uh, time and, and community meetings like this and others that we're going to work with you guys on to to get this done. So I'll I'll maybe leave it to, to Jim and Michelle for any last words um, before we wrap up. Michelle. Jim, thank you. I just appreciate everybody's participation and we look forward to continuing that participation into the future. Thank you for hanging out with us today and look forward to the, again, those additional conversations. So thank you. Thanks everybody. Um, the Office of Resilience uh, and our partners in the municipalities are here to provide service. So if we can get you better information, connect you to a department, um, just basically try to address the issues you're having real time. And we appreciate the fact you're thinking with us about what the long-term future also holds. Thanks everybody.